Hello and welcome to Narrowing It Down. And today we're talking about path dependency and the roads not yet taken because we are unable to take them. Path dependency is not a new idea, and it comes out of capitalist economics as much as anything else, although there are definitely precursors to the thinking. When you think about, say, the Aristotelian notion of teleos, something does what it is made to do, that is what its purpose is, what is unique to it is its purpose, that is its teleos. Now, Sounds a lot like path dependency, right? Your teleos is what you have to do. It's what you do because that is what you are made to do. But with evolution and knowledge of evolution as a theory, post-Darwin and the understanding of complex dynamics, such Aristotelian understandings of the world are not particularly helpful but they do rhyme with things that emerge in modern economic thinking. Path dependency though is more than just simple ideology or acting off of a logic of a system. When we talk about the system's logic. Well, what we really mean is the logic inculcated in a system that causes it to work. What it does, what it does it for. But path dependency is deeper than that. It explains once choices are made, whether they are rational or not, they limit other choices in the future. They set historical preferences because they change material culture. Why do we use the Phillips head screwdriver versus any other screwdriver? Well, that's because we have Phillips head screwdrivers around. Attempts to change to another screwdriver like a star head screwdriver is difficult because the tool is not readily available. The star head screwdriver may be more stable, may pull the screws out easier, may be more responsive to a drill, but we're not going to all use them in any significant amount because we have the old technology readily around. That's the most basic form of path dependency. But it has all kinds of downstream effects. So when we think about path dependency, we first have to get into the historical institutionalist school of thought from both the understanding of the capitalist firm to the understanding of political science. And this even relates to anthropological understandings such as uh, Joseph Tainter's anthropological complexity theory. Certain decisions have downstream effects, and those downstream effects may making other decisions, decisions even though they are better in the long run, are more efficient, are cheaper, are just more likely to lead to, say, civilizational survival in the most high-stakes form of this that we may be looking at. We cannot switch because we can't find an alternative easily without also dealing with the cost of switching. It is why usually the society that invents a technology a hundred years down the road has the infrastructure for that technology does not have the best form of that infrastructure because they laid the infrastructure 
first, working with the earliest materials. Other societies, other groups who laid infrastructure later could lay the improved infrastructure without the cost of taking the old infrastructure up. This is a path-dependent motivation. In this way, ideology and material world interact. So now I'm going to talk in Marxist forms. When you talk about the way the ideological world is actually reflected in the material world, path dependency is one of those ways. What do I mean by that? The choices made and the reasons why those choices were made may be long forgotten. And yet, because of the buildup of institutional and material culture, it may be inordinately expensive culturally, materially, economically to change. Now, so the most obvious thing that people will throw out is fossil fuels. Fossil fuels is a complication because we have not found a source of energy other than nuclear energy that is as energy dense in its realization and valorization, meaning that um, there's very little that's going to produce the, the amount of horsepower per ounce of material or effort used than fossil fuel. But we invest almost as much fossil fuel into getting the fossil fuel out of the ground as we do to maintaining it. That's one of the ironies of peak oil. It wasn't that we're going to run out of oil. It's that we are willing to invest more and more to get that oil out of the ground because we do not have the resources to retool the entire infrastructure. History matters. Material history matters. And the reasons why something was chosen in the past can be forgotten and it can still affect you. These can lead policymakers into making cautious or uninformed decisions, holding on to assumptions far past their use, all kinds of things. So, to get into path dependency, we really should deal with its instantiation. It is processes or events where each event is constrained by prior events. You see this in your own life, all right? It even affects your brain, the decisions you make as a teenager, set neural pathways that are going to be harder and harder to change as you age. There is neuroplasticity, but once you've made those decisions, they are path dependent. They are the kinds of things you're going to trigger later on. There may be other genetic reasons. There may be gene codes. There may be social reasons. All other things that come into play. Once you've made these decisions, these pathways start to build. This even affects you as a person. So any decision made in the past constrains decisions made in the future because the cost to change is high. It is higher to change and remove a path pathway than it is to lay an entirely new one. This is why, in some ways, reforming a very developed government may actually be harder than building that government in the first place. History matters. All right. The most obvious and most used example of path dependency were video cassette systems and the QWERTY P board. VHS players, probably not the best form of video cassette that was available in the 1970s and 80s, but it did lock in vendors because of distribution patterns. Once a VCR manufacturer started carrying it, there was a bandwagon effect. And certain other things, for example, change the effect. So one of the reasons that VCRs and VHS was one of the main forms of technology was actually a decision made by Betamax to shut out pornography from being distributed on its technology and mass production. 
whereas VHS did not care. Thus, VHS was more readily adopted despite um, a lot of its adoption having nothing to do with porn because it had a wider licensing for various reasons. So it doesn't matter that Betamax had the early lead in distribution. That crucial juncture changed the path development, even if Betamax was a better product. QWERTY keyboard is the same. QWERTY keyboard is probably not as efficient as a Dvorak keyboard. And yet, since it was already ubiquitous and people have been learning to type on it for literally a decade or two, it became path dependent, not just for typewriter technologies, but we still use it on computers today. Examples can go on and on. In economics and conventional economics, and we'll talk about how this affects Marxism, um, you can look at the work of someone like Paul David in 1985. Inferior standards can persist in certain industries um, because path dependence means that they're still more profitable, even in the long run, if they deplete all sorts of other elements of production. This also leads to, for example, um, business uh, agglomeration or the tendency of, of businesses to, to congregate in geographically small places to attract workers with the same sales sketch, which then draws businesses seeking experienced employees, which then causes feedback loops in the nation. Now, this actually has downstream political and social economic effects, particularly when it comes to things like network effects and the development of power law. And then it, it can make a system very vulnerable and just, again, in capitalist economic terms to negative feedback because it actually increases uh, local cost, uh, leads to hoarding of real estate, drives up real estate values to the fact to eat up more and more of the profits of a company. Um, but it makes it hard to move because people have already moved there with that skill set, trained in school, set for that skill set, etc. These are the two kinds of classic, and they're material, kinds of path dependence. But once you start seeing this, you can start seeing how this uh, leads to a bunch of things that can complicate a society, can lead to economic ruination. And this is when the Marxism can kick back in. You see... Much of what we're doing in capital, and the reason why these things can't change, is because hyper-complex systems are hard to remove. They make it hard to reform because they're counter-interest in maintaining other elements of the old system. This is why Marxists in the 20th century have been hesitant to say there were easy electoral paths to revolution. Yeah. People like Adam Porowski have even game theoried this out, that there are certain pathways that become statistically likely given prior decisions. And those prior decisions are set by things like nation states. The logic of a nation state, the logic of capital accumulation in a nation state, the fact capitalist firms are international, but they trade in nation states and are monitored in their trade by currency within a nation state, despite the fact that that currency is not uh, does not control capital inflows unless the nation is very large. It leads to all kinds of path-dependent decisions. This is why we say certain things cannot be another way under capitalism, right? The complexities be in that kind of accumulated system become an almost impossible thing to overcome within the system itself, Right. And there are all kinds of factors that go into this traditionally in normal uh, economic discussions of path dependency, not in the kind of 
uh, historical materialist version of historical institutionalism I'm doing right now, but you have things like the durability of capital equipment and their maintenance. How do you use priorly invested material and labor? Technical interrelatedness, how something was built and designed to work specifically with something else, increasing returns and decreasing returns. So how do you increase your scale in a system and get feedback from that system because of assumptions made priorly, both cultural and material? And if you can even separate those two things out. And then lastly, the dynamic increasing returns to adoption, meaning how is someone going to adopt a technology, a tactic, or a strategy based on prior investments in technologies, adaption, and strategies? Now, this leads to something called a critical juncture framework. So in a critical juncture, you have the ability to choose something different. Some kind of innovation has happened socially, materially, whatever. And there is a decision to be made. This is why leadership does actually matter. This is why we're not just pure economistic thinkers, all right? We don't assume that one thing is going to go a certain way. Because at critical junctures, you can change the path. But usually, there are only so many choices to be made at that juncture, and you never know when you're actually in a critical juncture. Usually, they're only recognized in hindsight. All right? If you look at uh, the work of Ruth and David Collier in political science, um, antecedent conditions allow contingent choices to direct an institution our government, our civilization, and consolidate power in a way that is difficult to reverse. These are locked in once they're made. And the only way to undo them is to unmake them, which is a larger energy cost than what was involved in making the decision in the first place. All right. So this is not a one-to-one -one deterministic, you know, Newtonian view of the universe here. For those of you who don't know, that's a clockmaker universe um, where everything had to be the way it is because there was no other way for it to be because there is no contingency in the universe. That was actually kind of an assumed worldview in European thinking um, during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um but there are reactive sequences, um, things that can happen and trip off. We call this blowback. So there's path dependency and blowback. And then path dependency leads to complexity. How much more complicated a system do you have to maintain? How much more energy do you have to put into that system to maintain the same path? Now, this is why I talk about things like uh, declining rates of profits and physical commodities, um, limits to rents, these kind of things matter. They are path dependent. People who tell you that this is just about changing the way you conceive of the path need to also tell you that you have to change the material conditions of the world that make that path more likely. This is why we talk about this in the way we do in Marxism. No, Marx, Marx did not know about path dependency. The concept was not clear to him, but there's a logical way you can see this. We create the world, but we're limited by the past. The weight of dead generations lay upon us. This is implied in Marxian and Hegelian thinking. Once the decision is made, it weighs on generations and it is hard to undo. When it is undone, it is tend to undone in truly revolutionary cycles because the path is exhausted. But unlike the people who talk about teleological necessity, path dependency can go and be undone in many different ways. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about other elements of systems theory. This is a fundamental assumption you need to understand. And you don't need to be a Marxist or buy into Marxist frameworks to get why this is important and to get why it is going to be very hard for you to just do what you want to do by, say, electing Bernie Sanders for president because the pathways are larger than the presidency. 
and they affect the way the president thinks. The choices are already limited. Your cultural habitats, the material culture of your world, all that is limiting you already. You can't think beyond it, but you have to be at a critical juncture to make that change happen. And if you're not, you can't do much. And with this, I'm hoping to start nailing some key concepts down. Each action we do or don't take has consequences, both personally and politically. And people need to understand that. We cannot just imagine a new world. We have to create the conditions for it. Please like and subscribe. Um, if you want more, I have a Patreon. Uh, you can find it somewhere on the show links. Um, if you go to the show page, you'll find a little button. And there will be where it's at. Um I have some supporters I need to thank, so I'm going to do that right now. So I have the Khan Il Kahanan level. Um, path dependent, of course, on my love of all things Mongolian. And uh, the Khan Il Kahanans get to commission episodes once a year and, and do other things too. Um, they can be commissioned an episode by asking me to take on a guest. Uh, if they're a long time, this guest may even be a public guest. Uh, they can come on the Patreon show for the patron only cast, all kinds of benefits. Um, and you can find that, but you know what? I, you know, I don't need you to give me your money necessarily. If you want most of it, most of what I do is available for free. Um, just share so people can get the ideas out. Maybe one day, though, with enough of you, I can hire someone to turn these into swanky videos instead of me just talking into a camera. But I kind of like the me talking to the camera aesthetic, personally. All right. Well, with that said, I'd like to thank my kind of Kahanans, uh, Thomas J., David P., and Cody. Thank you so much for your support. Um, we really appreciate it here. And with that, we're out.